In this week, we're talking about takeoff and landing locations and everything you need to know about them. We'll also attempt to answer questions about takeoff and landing from places like National Trust, footpaths, public spaces. Or what about no drone signs? We'll even take a look at takeoff and landing from a moving vessel. And what about in the dark? I'll also give you a simple tip that actually saved my drone from being taken by a dog when I was about to land. <laughs> This video is based on UK law and my understanding of that with the O2 CFC and GVC. Before I even get to the location, I'll check the airspace and have a little look on Google Maps and see that my drone is legally able to fly there. I did a much more detailed video about this that I'll put in the end card of this video. So the basic act of taking off, your drone needs to be able to spin its propellers fast enough to take off. If the propellers are impeded by something like grass or sticks or something like that, the chances are that your drone is going to throw an error and it won't take off. Ideally, we don't want to be taking off from an area that has lots of dust that's likely to get into the gimbal of the camera. I'll always look for two takeoff and landing locations, both the primary one and a secondary one if there is a problem if somebody walks up to you or if you need to find another place. So always have that in your mind. I'm looking for a flat surface that is free of grass and debris, leaves, anything like that. A couple of meters across, ideally. Avoid areas like walls and car roofs, car bonnets. Car bonnets and roofs are very slippery. So if you're landing or taking off, your drone can literally just fall off of that area. And walls, again, if they're very narrow, uh, the drone might not take off correctly and it might just tip and it'll be gone. Another major consideration about takeoff and landing location is to be able to maintain the separation distances for your drone. Obviously, larger drones might have a 50 meter separation distance, depending on your qualification. But even for a sub 250 gram drone that has no mandated separation distance between the drone and uninvolved people, it doesn't mean that you can get so close to them that you'll put people in danger. So be careful of that. And it's not just about people. What about wildlife? What about dogs? What about uh, nesting birds, for instance? It's actually illegal to cause disturbance to wildlife, especially if birds are nesting, for instance. When you take off, you might actually find you draw attention of birds that are surrounding the area too. So think about that as well. What's flying around? Uh, and if you're close to a nesting site. Also think about the timing. So even though you wouldn't want to fly from a shopping precinct at 2 p.m. on a Saturday, if you were to do that same location at 6 a.m. on a Saturday, you may get much more success. Timing is paramount. It's vital that the area taken off and the landing from doesn't have an overhanging tree, cables, whether they be telephone cables or power cables. Even though you may be able to pilot around it, if there was a problem, uh, by where your drone is coming back automatically under the return to home function, then your drone won't know they're there and it may well crash into that tree or those cables. So that's another major consideration. I've never really used a takeoff and landing pad. And even when I went and did my GVC uh, flight test, I managed to forget my landing pad. So I have to use a car mat. But equally, you could use an item of clothing, a coat. You could use a... Uh, a banner if you've got a business so maybe put your drone logo on a banner and have one that's a meter or two meters wide and that actually often makes a better landing pad than the ones you buy off amazon make sure if you're using a landing pad you fully push in the spikes that come with it to hold it down because propellers have a habit of finding those one thing you won't find me talking about is taking off and landing from your hand now i think it's quite dangerous and, and in fact it's probably the most common drone injury so I would suggest you don't do that. And if you want to do it, this is not the video for you. Just remember GPS and let it actually acquire the GPS location. Before you take off, it says home point updated. I've never had a problem with GPS not getting a lock eventually. It can take a while for your drone to lock on if it's not been turned on for a while or if you've moved a large amount between the last flight 
because it needs to work out where those satellites in the sky and it'll take it a little while to do that. But I've never had an instance where it hasn't locked on. But you could have a problem actually if you're flying where there's steep uh, cliff sides, so you're flying at the bottom of a ravine maybe, or if you're flying in a built up area that's got big buildings around it that blocks the sky, then it may take longer for your drone to set its home point. Home point now you could technically fly without setting a home point and that would be fine, but just remember your return to home won't work. So now we have the basics, let's look in a little more detail about places like National Trust, English Heritage, public land, footpaths, and what about no drone signs? Now, just before we get into this, just remember, this is not legal advice. I am not a lawyer, so this is how I approach these locations, and it's up to you if you choose to do that or not but that is really down to you. So let's first look at the best place to take off and land from and consider the gold standard. And it's what I learned to do through my GVC. And that is taking off and landing from private land where you have permission of the landowner. Whether you are videoing football practice for your local grassroots team or capturing an amazing action sequence for the latest Bond movie, landowner's permission is king. It also leaves you in a very good legal standpoint. You can cordon yourself off an area and give your space to take off and land without worry of the general public walking into your location. But still remember to have a backup. Next, let's look at public land. Most land you can walk onto is either owned by the local or borough council. Now you can always email the local council and see if they'll give you permission if you want to take off and land from that location or you can also check for bylaws from your local council. Now get to your local council website and search on there to see the local bylaws. As far as emailing local councils I've had both positive and less than positive results from that. We, we wouldn't give you permission um, because We've had this out with our insurers and their answer to us is if we give permission then uh, anything that happens as a result, so for example, if it falls out of the sky yeah. or if it damages something, then we're partially liable. So I believe that no is the National Trust and in fact English Heritage is the default answer. Unless of course you're doing a job directly for them or you are a TV or production company that's got a decent budget to pay. If you were to have an accident, and somebody were to get hurt on National Trust land and that person realised the National Trust had given permission to the drone pilot to fly there, then they are likely to come after the National Trust more than the drone pilot themselves because they're the bigger organisation with bigger pockets. I have seen an interaction between a drone pilot, not me, and a National Trust ranger on one of the National Trust sites. The guy flying obviously didn't realise he's on National Trust land and to be honest he probably didn't have a fly ID and it was even flying within a flight restricted zone. But anyway, uh, the National Trust Ranger just asked him politely to stop, he did. So if you get any problems on National Trust land, I'll suggest if someone asks you to stop, just stop. I've flown from National Trust land many times. I uh, always find a discreet place or discreet time and I've only ever once seen a no drone sign and that was at the Lizard Peninsula. Of course, I checked signage for no drone signs at any location and we'll come back to the no drone signs bit in a minute. I once tried to get permission to fly an English heritage site. Now, just a little bit of background. This was to promote an event they were having at their site. And although not directly for the English heritage, it was actually for a reenactment group that was doing the event. And it would have looked amazing. It was in a local fort. And English heritage sent me an email asking for my insurance, my qualification, all this sorts of stuff, which I all had. Uh, which was fine, but what they then wanted was a fee. So I, I gave them the information, but asked exactly what am I getting for my fee, because I can get the footage I want from outside of the location. Exactly what are they offering? I'm still waiting for the response. I also think English Heritage aren't particularly well set up for what are effectively hobbyist flights around their sites. If you're a production company or a film company, then that's fine because you don't mind paying a fee because it's in the budget but for what is effectively a kind of almost a hobbyist flight, so easier for them again to say no, because then they don't have the risk. So what about taking off and landing from a moving object like a boat? Have you ever flown from a boat or something moving? Because I've done this once and it gave all sorts of problems and that's what we're gonna get into next. But let me know in the comments if you've flown from something that's moving. A 
couple of years back, I flew from a small boat on Derwent Water. Now, I actually made a video about that that uh, you can see on my channel, but it gave some interesting problems. First thing you need to do is increase the maximum distance if you are moving with your drone. I had uh, the issue of trying to get the drone to come back to me. Because it had reached its maximum distance, it wouldn't go any further. It took me a few minutes to work this out. Remember also that returning to home, it's gonna go back to your first location. And if the boat was there and now it's not, it's gonna be a very wet landing. The other thing to think about is if your boat or vessel is moving, drones don't like moving places it'll really struggle to land. In my instance, I had to almost crash land it. Strangely, I think the best thing to land a small drone might be a landing net. <laughs> so exactly what are no drone signs about? So remember, if you read the drone code, it asks you to check for no drone signs before you fly. I think they come in two flavors, really. The first are the generic signs that you can probably buy off Amazon nowadays, and I look at those as a request from the landowner for you to not fly from their land. I may or may not obey these, but in the past, I've always obeyed them. Remember, a private landowner can actually tell you what they want and permit on their land. So if they want you to not fly something or they want you not to ride a bike or want you not to ride a horse or a skateboard or whatever, they can ask you not to do that. Of course, you can disobey, then you would be in breach of their rule and they might ask you to leave. The other sort are used by local councils or the police to let you know about a temporary flight restriction. I've seen these used at places like Bournemouth Air Show. They will normally list the exact law for which you will be breaking if you fly. And that is normally the Air Navigation Order of 2016. These signs are to be obeyed. They would normally be backed up by a temporary flight restriction in drone apps like Altitude Angel. Remember, DJI app doesn't show UK airspace directly. I made a video about that, but that's not the subject of this one. I think we could also get a third, and that's where uh, councils choose to introduce a public space protection order where they consider drones to be a nuisance in a particular place. Footpaths are often run across private land, and just like any other piece of land, a landowner can say, I don't want you to stop and have a picnic. I don't want you to camp overnight. I don't want you to fly a drone. And this is perfectly acceptable for the landowner to say. Of course, you might be able to fly from a footpath without any problems, but just remember that there might be many, many people walking down that footpath. There might be children, there might be dogs. And the clue is kind of in the name, but it's a footpath, not a drone flying path. Just bear that in mind and definitely have a backup location because remember your drone can fly, you can walk, and as long as you can maintain your visual line of sight and you can land almost anywhere. If someone or something is put in danger from your drone flying activity on a footpath though, it would likely be you that end up in court. This could potentially be a breach of the Air Navigation Order 2016, Article 241. You must not recklessly endanger people or property with your drone. So we, we've covered a lot of the taking off stuff now. So what about the landing? Personally, I always try and land with at least 30% battery life. Having this approach has saved me more than once from actually losing my drone. If a takeoff and landing place isn't ideal, like it's a footpath, and there are lots of people that have suddenly used it, then you might want to give yourself more time to land too. I recently flew at Robin Hood's Bay, and when I took off from the bay, which was uh, literally on the seafront, there was nobody there. About 20 minutes later, when I was trying to land, it was covered in people. So I had to go and find myself a different place to land. Obviously, I'd already sussed it out, so I checked it. Another place I flew recently where the having the extra battery life saved me was Whitby Abbey. Now, obviously not within the Whitby Abbey, but uh, I flew from a, a car park up there. As I was coming to land, there was a dog that approached me. Now, the dog was really interested in the drone. I saw the dog coming. Obviously, you'd always check your surrounding area before you land. The dog's owners saw what was happening and they came and got the dog. It took a couple of minutes, but because I had the extra battery life, that was fine. So just bear in mind, always land with at least 30% because it gives you options. If my drone had been trying to land because it had minimum battery life, then that could have ended very differently. So always bear that in mind too. You might argue the dog shouldn't have been off the lead, but in reality, I could now be looking forward to a legal case uh, from either me to the dog owner or from the dog owner to me, where we are trying to prove one or other is in the wrong I could have had a broken drone. And what's easier? Proving you're not in the wrong or just taking a little bit more time, a little bit more care 
and land safely. When flying at night, just bear in mind that all these things I've already mentioned are even more important. What else you need to do before flying at night that isn't necessarily about takeoff and landing, but go and have a look in the daylight and just check for things like cables that you might not see in the dark, overhead power cables, you should obviously see trees, but it'll give you a good understanding of uh, where to fly from. And you can also pick out yourself a place to take off and land from before it gets dark, which is easier. But the other main really requirement, what I'd say with you, if you're gonna fly in the dark, I'm not talking about the drone, not talking about strobe light, but is actually lighting the area from which you take off and land because many drones like the Mini 2, Mini 3, Mini 4s don't have landing lights. So they won't necessarily identify the ground as the drone is, is coming down. The sensors would normally see the ground below and they obviously slow the propellers and it'll know when it's landed. But if it can't see the ground, if it's not illuminated, then it won't see exactly when, when it's gonna land. It could lead to uh, quite a heavy landing, which obviously you don't wanna have. So it's easier if you can just uh, shine your torch on the ground before your drone lands. So when it's like two or three meters up, put the torch on, then your drone will see exactly where the landing point is. Let me know in the comments what you think about takeoff and landing locations. Do you agree that you should be very careful from flying from a public footpath? If you've enjoyed the video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you've really enjoyed it, you might want to subscribe to this channel because this is the sort of video I make, hopefully explaining some of the rules and helping you fly in more places. And if you've enjoyed that, you're definitely gonna like this one.